Are we fighting the postmodern activists with one hand tied behind our backs? A standard problem that good people have in fighting the bad is that the bad are willing to use tactics that the good people aren't. And the good resist using those tactics because they don't want to turn into the bad. In this episode, I want to focus on two strategy points. Uh, one is that the Postmodern activists' most important asset is one that we give to them for free and which we should withdraw. The other is that the moral high ground does have short-term costs, but is long-term much more effective. So let's start with one arena of conflict with the postmoderns, arguments. Now, intellectual battles, they are the cognitive lifeblood of any healthy society. Life is very complicated. The stakes are high. So thoughtful and passionate people, you know, they're going to have lots of arguments because it's only by argument that we can sort out the facts about complicated matters. That's exactly what arguments are, structuring all of the data and seeing what does and does not follow. And it's only by putting our ideas to the test of evidence and by being willing to change our minds that we can make progress. Now, this is not fun often. Intellectual fighting can be unpleasant, but it is better than settling our differences by physical fighting. The advantage of being an intelligent species, the Austrian philosopher Karl Popper, who pointed this out, is that we can let our theories die in our place. So we put them to the test, let the bad theories die. We don't have to die ourselves. But for arguments to be productive, we need principles of civility to guide our investigations and our debates. And we need especially our leading institutions, schools, and especially those like universities that are supposed to be dedicated to truth-seeking to make those principles of civility explicit and foundational and to instill them in the next generation. So this means we do have a strategy and tactics problem because the postmodernists don't fight by the same rules that the rest of us do. When everything is subjective narratives, as the postmoderns believe, then subversion of everything goes all the way down if that fits your subjective preferences. Now, our classic rules are as follows. You know, approach discussion with a spirit of benevolence. Give people the initial benefit of the doubt. Make one's goal in argument the mutual advancement of understanding. Hear out both sides or all sides, depending on the case. Be civil in criticizing and in receiving criticizing. Don't just make stuff up and believe that the truth matters. But the postmoderns cast a very jaded eye on the truth, and cynically they will see words merely as weapons in a battle between adversarial groups. And in that battle, they believe power is the only reality, and truth, often put in quotation marks, truth is merely the most persistent or ruthless survival. The American postmodern philosopher Richard Wordy put it this way in a revealing moment, quote, Truth is what your contemporaries let you get away with saying, unquote. I'll have the source for that in the transcription when it's posted, but note that getting away with stuff is being legitimized by a famous postmodern philosopher. And Rorty's postmodern fellow travelers in France, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and the others, they're working the same broadly deconstructive territory. Now, this is important because it's the difference, uh, to take an example, between you know, two lawyers arguing in a court over the facts and the best interpretation of them, their goals being truth and justice. And in contrast to both of them, the lawyers who just see the courtroom as a power struggle in which all that matters is who's best at rhetorical manipulation and procedural manipulation. 
Now, our code of ethics, by contrast, also includes rules about the moral values at stake. Right? We should be respectful in argument of legitimate differences. We should tolerate an expansive range of beliefs and practices unless physical force is initiated. That's where we will draw the line. Do not name call or hurl insults easily. Be admiring of others' accomplishments. Be proud of one's own. Admit mistakes culturally and individually and strive to correct them. And we take those as foundational moral principles for our social interactions, particularly in argumentation. But notice on that latter point about taking responsibility for mistakes. Now, individual improvement, cultural improvement, both of them are trial and error processes. And that's to say there will be errors. And while we have made, I think, great progress in battling poverty, slavery, sexism, racism, incivilities, it's absolutely true that our historical record is not perfect. And so I think it's morally appropriate that we do have intense debates about, for example, affirmative action and reparations. And we are intensely engaged with the questions of, can we make up for the sins of the past? Right? And if we are going to try to make up for the sins of the past, how are we going to make good in a way that apportions blame and desert fairly? Now, those are hard questions, but morally responsible people take their history seriously. Now here again, Richard Rorty represents, to my mind, the other, the postmodern side. Right? When he was asked directly about the left, the political left's many historical sins, crimes, and outright brutalities, and it's important here to notice that all of the leading postmoderns of the first two generations are of the left, usually of the very far left, so in response to this question about the left's many historical sins, Rorty replied, direct quote, I think that a good left is a party that always thinks about the future and doesn't care much about our past sins, unquote. Now, that to me makes it very unsurprising that younger leftists have very little understanding or very little care about the Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Cuban, even more recent Venezuela. Because again, we have a leading postmodern philosopher legitimizing, simply forgetting about one's past mistakes. And that's a profound irresponsibility. Now, I'm using Rorty here as a foil, but it is important also that he is a mild postmodernist. He's one who, despite his philosophy officially of getting away with stuff and its calculated forgetfulness, who hopes that we can, in limited ways, still try to be nice to each other. But the door is opened by the leading philosophers to their contemporaries and followers, and in the next generation, they are not so nice. The nastiest insults fly, right? Drop of a hat, fascist, racist toxic, sexist, pig, and so on. That's not only from the intellectual leadership now itself or even the graduated activists, but increasingly among undergraduate students now at scores of universities across the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, precisely in places where the postmodern ethos or anti-ethos has taken place. I should parenthetically note that there are no snowflakes, by the way, among the student activists. Right? As young adults, they've all watched scary movies. They've argued rudely and crudely with their schoolmates. They've had their hearts broken. They've learned about environmental degradation, the Holocaust. They've seen online pornography. In most cases, you know, they've lost grandparents and other loved ones. You know, They might be young people, but they have not been raised in bubbles. So when they, those activists, are calling for safe spaces free from the expression of opinions that might hurt their feelings or that they don't like, more is going on than just hurt feelings. Also, when you find those same student activists hurling macro insults against perceived microaggressions, you can know that a rhetorical weapon is being deployed. They've been trained. They've been trained well by their postmodern professors about tactics for shutting down their opponents in the ideological wars. Delicate snowflakes don't use crude language and harsh confrontation. 
join Professor Stephen Hicks on his Adventures in Postmodernism tour next March in Australia, where he'll be giving you his insights and lessons on the subject firsthand. Find out what makes postmodernism attractive. Why is it so dangerous? How has it evolved or mutated over the years? Does postmodernism have strong connections to neo-Marxism? What is the role of it in cultural wars, campus battles over free speech, political correctness, intellectual diversity, identity politics and the rise of Antifa and alternative right? What other political movements are now adopting postmodernism strategies and how do we resolve these issues of postmodernism? Stephen Hicks will be appearing in four major Australian cities throughout March 2019. He'll be doing an evening talk in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide and Brisbane starting at 7pm and will be holding an all-day special event masterclass series starting at 9am on March 10th in Melbourne and March 16th in Sydney where he will delve even deeper into understanding postmodernism, its history and teach you valuable strategies to actually combat it. For full details and to reserve your tickets today, go to truearrowevents.com. Select the event to which you would like to attend, and if you hurry, you may even be lucky enough to get your tickets at early bird prices at a 50% discount. And while you're online, please leave us a review for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. So, how do we deal with vigorous activists who are cynical about truth and civil debate? Well, big topic, but I think the first step really is to understand what we are up against and where it came from. Bad philosophy got us into this mess, so philosophical self-education is essential. And merely clarifying one's adversary's beliefs is all by itself empowering. And that, I think, means grasping the fundamentality and the audacity of the postmodern challenge. I will put some reading recommendations in the transcription when it's posted for follow-up reading on postmodernism, not only in philosophy, but in some other areas, historiography, literary criticism, law, science, and so on. Now, on that fundamentality, when we're talking about postmoderns, it's important to recognize the postmoderns are not simply or merely those who believe, you know, knowledge is hard. Truth can be slippery. Goodness is rare. Every intelligent and thoughtful person knows that. And so we can and we should be having vigorous debates among well-meaning liberals and conservatives, optimists and pessimists, naturalists and religious people, objectivists and subjectivists, and so on, about what the right answers are or what the best answers are. But postmodernism and the postmodernists in both theory and in practice are a more dangerous phenomenon because they make it clear that they are purely negative, purely critical, and purely adversarial. Their interest is not in solving problems and suggesting improvements and trying to figure out by argument and benevolent discussion how best to approach things. Rather, it is in causing more problems and making things worse. Think if you've seen the movie Fight Club. That's a perfect theatrical demonstration of the strategy here. And here is Michel Foucault himself speaking about the nature of his investigations. Quote, These investigations are not intended to ameliorate, alleviate, or make an oppressive system more bearable. They are intended to attack it in places where it is called something else. Justice, technique, knowledge, objectivity. Each investigation must therefore be a political act, unquote. Again, the source will be in the transcription. But notice, we're not at all interested in improving the system, making it bearable, solving problems, and so on. We are about attack, and we are about attacking the system that pretends, in our view, to be about justice, knowledge, and objectivity. We are politicizing everything all the way down. So the point is the postmoderns are rejecting everything important about our civilization root and branch as oppressive. Now notice the key word from Martin Heidegger. 
right? Uh, Martin Heidegger is a philosopher, early part of the 20th century. In his writings, all the major postmodernists, especially those of the first and second generation, are just steeped. And Heidegger argued that our entire Western tradition, from the classical Greeks on, must be subject to destruction. And that's in the German with a K. Note that a generation before Heidegger, Friedrich Nietzsche, another hero to the postmodernists, argued powerfully that Western intellectual and cultural life in its entirety had exhausted itself and that we were into an age of nihilism. Now, just pulling the main quotes from Foucault, Heidegger, and Nietzsche here oppression, attack, destruction, nihilism, those are the core of the postmodern framework. And since their target is Western civilization, but Western civilization is increasingly becoming a misnomer, classical and enlightenment values are spreading around the world, and that means the stakes truly are global. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, he writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists, and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose, in the wrong place, as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy-to-understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do sceptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left, the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all and optimism, now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism? This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. Pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now, while the postmoderns are about oppression, attack, destruction, nihilism, they know that we, advocates of civilization, we are serious about our ideals, about truth, about justice, that we take pride in our great but imperfect progress. And it's precisely our seriousness and our pride that the postmoderns are aiming to subvert. They want to replace them with cynicism, with self-doubt, with guilt. And that is precisely why there are relentless charges of racial sin, gender sin, financial sin, the notion of privilege and guilt relentlessly, and the constant accusations of hidden, unsavory motives on our part. Understanding postmodernism is a start, but I don't think that's enough. Right? That's the intellectual job, right? but we also need action step, both as intellectuals and activists ourselves, when we're parents, when we're educators, business professionals, and politicians. What do we do about postmodernism to defend and advance genuine civilization? Now, that's also a hard question, but I do think as a start, it's helpful to recognize that a purely negative, purely critical, purely nihilistic philosophy is uncreative. By its nature, it's only going to be destructive. It can't itself offer any truth. It can't offer any goodness, no beauty, no creation of value is going to come out of it. That means it has to be parasitic on those philosophies that do, in fact, generate positivity in the world. 
What that means is that the postmoderns and the postmodernism system right, depends on the system that it's attacking, right, both for its material resources and its moral status. So the strategic action step is to take away the resources. Now Jacques Derrida stated forthrightly in one of his books, Writing Indifference, that what postmodernism was giving birth to was, quote, the formless, mute, infant, and terrifying form of monstrosity, unquote. I wonder what that would sound like in a French accent, but the English translation here is, we are giving birth to monsters. And the response is, we have to starve the beast. Now here, I think the most important resources are the ones that the postmoderns are given to them by us, and most especially our moral sanction. Moral sanction is a powerful psychological force. When we believe in the rightness of our cause, we are empowered. When we are filled with self-doubt and guilt, we feel the opposite of that. We feel disempowered. But at the same time, when we give moral sanction to the postmodernists, when we treat them as misguided idealists or as serious about problem solving, then we do give them a moral standard that they are just in turn using to attack, often viciously, our sense of moral worth. And then when we are attacked by vicious tactics, it's always tempting to respond in kind. So it's important to recognize where the attacks are coming from and withhold any moral sanction from a purely nihilistic, purely negative philosophy. Now, the high road that we take does involve costs, but it's also important to remember that across the centuries, we have advanced civilization against amoral and immoral adversaries precisely by taking the high, the high road. Right? It's been in the hard work that actual human beings did. That's what created the material prosperity that we all benefit from. From the honest thinking that eliminated the crippling diseases and doubled lifespans. In the righteousness of our vigorously attacking slavery. Right? We didn't make slaves of the slaveholders. Right? We maintained our moral righteousness. That deep commitment to justice that extended liberties and equalities to men and women of all races and ethnicities, and doing so on the basis of a philosophy that strives for objectivity and often achieves it. We are the force for truth and goodness in the world. That's always the only thing that has worked. That is to say, we have the moral high ground, and we should recognize it and take pride in it. By contrast, it's precisely the postmoderns who have bought into a philosophy of pessimism and cynicism. They're the ones who've given in to jaded despair, and their attacks are meant to bring us down precisely to their low level. So we do need to understand postmodernism, but we should not sanction it. Yet, we can only remove our sanction because we know our own genuine accomplishments and the ideas, especially the philosophical ideas that made them possible in the first place. So, know your enemy, yes, but first, know yourself. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time, and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favourite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher.